Hi, my name is Rene. In this video, I'm going to try to go deeper into the evidence of near-death experiences. And especially what I want to try to answer in this video is the question, does near-death experiences provide evidence of life after death? And to do this, I'm going to get a little help uh, from the movie, the BBC documentary, The Day I Died. And here's the first movie. To rule out anecdotal and subjective accounts, Dr. Parnier's research was extremely selective. He included only people who had suffered cardiac arrest and had been clinically dead. The term near death is a very wide term which is very difficult to define, and therefore we decided to study a group of people who've objectively and scientifically reached the point of death. We know from clinical practice that the definition of clinical death is a person who has no heartbeat and no breathing, and also whose brain stops functioning. And looking at the, what happens to a patient during cardiac arrest is that by definition they have the first two criteria, and that within a few seconds their brain also stops functioning. And therefore we have the closest model to study the dying process. As Sam Permia explains here in the clip, the near-death experience is a very wide phenomenon. It happens under really different circumstances. But because we're in this relation and in this video, I want to talk about the scientific evidence. That's why we here are trying to look, as Sam has done his research, at the scientific and objective cases of clinically death. And I'll just have Dr. Peter Fenno explain this closer. What exactly does clinically death mean? When you have a cardiac arrest, if you monitor brain waves or the electrical activity of the brain, you find that within eight seconds, it's almost absent. And it's absent throughout the brain, so you don't have little pockets of activity. So to all intents and purposes, once the heart has stopped, the brain ceases to function. Now we know from our neuroscience that you cannot have experience without a functioning brain. So once the brain function has stopped, then all experience must stop. If it doesn't stop for any reason, then you, you've made a very strong statement. The statement you made here that uh, Dr. Peter Fermi is talking about is that consciousness continues beyond the brain. And that is really the argument and the proof of life after death that near-death experiences provide us really. Because if consciousness can exist beyond the brain, outside the brain, then it is not very far to conclude that it can also exist. Consciousness can also exist without the brain and thereby without the body. And that is really the argument and the evidence of near-death experience that suggests that life continue. And what's really important to understand in what I've just shown about the, the measurement of the brain activity is that that is probably the most defining evidence of the near-death experience that all skeptical arguments and all skeptical theories cannot explain. So this means that all skeptical arguments such as the near-death experience is a dream, it's a hallucination, it is uh, elepsia, it is uh, rim intrusion, it is uh, all kinds of drugs. All these explanations, they involve a normal functioning of the brain that can be measured. But yet here we have scientific studies and evidence of near-death experience where they have a near-death experience that cannot be measured, meaning that conscious, they have a conscious near-death experience outside the normal functioning of the brain. So this clearly separates the near-death experience from all these skeptical theories of hallucination, dream, and whatever you have, even drugs, because all these experiences, all these states can be measured within the brain. But still, we have many cases of near-death experience that happen beyond this measurement and thereby beyond the brain. And one of the most uh, hard and most solid pieces of evidence we have of this in the near-death research is the case uh, of Pam Reynolds in 1991 and I'll just show a clip uh, about this. The operation Pam was about to undergo was known as Operation Standstill. Pam's body temperature would be lowered to between 10 and 15 degrees centigrade. Her heart and breathing stopped, her brain waves flattened and the blood drained from her head she would be clinically dead for a whole hour of the operation. What we want to do is we want to bring that brain to a halt. We don't just want the brain to be asleep. We want the metabolic activity of the brain to stop. Every measurable output that the body puts out really disappears completely so that you have 
no measurable neuronal activity whatsoever. Prior to the operation starting, a lot of activity goes on. Uh, the patient is put to sleep. Uh, the eyes are taped shut. There are, are little clicking devices put in each ear in order to monitor the brain. The patient is then completely covered. The only thing that's really exposed is the area of the head where we work. Dr. Spetzler explains here that every measurable output disappeared completely, meaning that her brainwave activity, her EEG measurement was totally flat, and this was for more than an hour. But even so, during this time, during her experience, she was able to see, she was able to, after her, her operation, she was able to describe the instruments used, and she was also able to uh, explain and repeat some of the conversations between the doctor and the nurse during the operation, which was then later objectively verified that what she saw and what she heard was actually true happening during the operation. Still, of course, there is skepticism because this is a very solid uh, piece of evidence and it receives also a lot of uh, skepticism. The skepticism is more that maybe she saw the instruments, operating instruments before, after the operation and, and so on. But what's really important here in the argument, whether consciousness continues, is whether she had her experience before or after the, the, the flat EEG, which skepticism claims, or she in fact had it during the flat EEG, which is the really important point here. I'll just show another clip to show this. At that stage in the operation, nobody can observe here in that state. And I find it inconceivable that your normal senses, such as hearing, let alone the fact that she had clicking modules in each ear, that there was any way for her to hear those through normal auditory pathways. So again, this is very suggestive of the fact that there was some sort of extrasensory perception or out-of-body experience or whatever uh, occurring at the time that was allowing Pam to hear accurately and uh, seemingly see accurately what was going on in the operating room at the time. Pam's testimony of the operation describes the events from actually the beginning at around 11.25 a.m. of the operation till the end of the operation, which was about 2 o'clock p.m. So really, all her, uh, her objectively verified observations, including the conversation between the doctor and the nurse during the operation, they actually begin from the beginning of the operation and they end at the end. So that is really a very clear evidence that she had her experience and she was outside the body during the operation, not before, not after, but during the operation. That is really a very uh, strong suggestion that this happens during the operation. So what's left? Um, well, now I guess it's time to uh, listen to what the near-death experience of what Pam and others say about their experience, how they see it from their side. The closer I got to the light, I began to discern different figures different people and I distinctly heard my grandmother call me and I immediately went to her and it felt great nobody says you're dying that you're just allowed to sort of become aware of things and I wasn't even bothered about what I'd left behind absolutely that's the moment my life changed that is the moment my life changed had I not had that near-death experience I would have no interest in being here today. I think death is an illusion. I think death is a really nasty, bad lie. I don't see any truth in the word death at all. That is really the conclusion. If we are to forget the scientific evidence and just listen to the testimonies, that's really what near-death experiences tell us. All of them, almost all of them, that's 9 in 10, 90% say that they believe they were not near death, they were actually in death, they were actually there, where this case is all about. And they all believe that life continues. That is about 90% of all the cases. So that's it. That's enough for the evidence. If you want to know more about near-death experience, if you want to know more about me, you can look up my book. It's called Awakening After Life. It's available on Amazon. You can also do your own research on Google or look some of my other videos. I wish you good luck and an interesting journey. Enjoy.